Welcome to this week's edition of the St. Paul Podcast. I'm Peter Marty, Senior Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church, located in the heart of Davenport, Iowa. Right here each week, you can hear a message to inspire your walk with God and hear beautiful music to fill your life. Let this podcast be your occasion to contemplate some of the deepest things in life, just as I hope it helps faith come alive for you. The musical piece, Messiah, composed by Georg Friedrich Handel, is known the world over, a classic piece of awesome goodness. And so many people, so many, many people, even those outside the church, are well familiar with it. College choirs often sing it as part of their annual Christmas or Easter tradition. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill be made low, the crooked, straight, and the rough places plain. This beautiful aria sung. The words of that little verse from the Messiah are from the prophet Isaiah, who spoke them to the Hebrew people returning home from a 50-year exile in Babylon. So you have to imagine, demoralized and short on hope, these Israelites suddenly receive assurance from the prophet Isaiah that the highway home to Jerusalem and their God will be emptied of obstacles. So listen to that passage from the 40th chapter here of the book of Isaiah. And not only is that great verse from Handel's Messiah included here, but Isaiah also talks about the fleeting or the transient nature 
of human life, the shortness of human life. Take a listen. Comfort, comfort, O my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, the crooked shall become straight and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see this glory together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Yes, the people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of the Lord stands forever. Those are the first eight verses of Isaiah's 40th chapter. And for my message here, I want to have you thinking about what is crooked in this world, but more than that, what is crooked about your life, and what it might mean to have the grace of God assisting you through the twists and the turns, the bumps and the hiccups of things you can't exactly control. So put your mind to that if you would, and here now, take a listen. I don't know everything that North Dakota, the state of North Dakota, is famous for, and I also don't know how long or how short that list of fame might be. Uh, certainly from what I've experienced in Fargo in the wintertime, I think it should be the long underwear capital of the world. I have no idea how cars run in Minot, North Dakota, in the depths of December and January, but they do. One feature of the state of North Dakota that uh, its own citizens are really proud of is their Highway 46. It's this two-lane asphalt road that runs east-west, and they're proud of it because it is said to be the longest, straightest road in all of North America. For 123 miles, or two hours and two minutes to drive it. You can go east-west on Highway 46 and never have to turn. You could lock the steering wheel, and if you had a semi-autonomous vehicle and put it in self-driving mode, you could probably lean back and take a nap. But please don't ever do that, because you don't want to fork your life over to technology or the lives of others as well. Most of the roads we navigate in life, they are not so straight at all. Um, my favorite, the one that my wife and I drive every summer, is in Door County, Wisconsin. It's got some dips in it. If you take it five or ten miles over the limit, you hit those dips, and it's just fun as it zigzags <laughs> through the woods. An aerial photo, I think, would make it look like a snake, honestly, of asphalt. Well, when John the Baptist was out in the wild, standing on a laundry basket, talking to people about all their laundry, out in the middle of nowhere somewhere, he was, remember, the precursor or the forerunner to Jesus, he borrowed these words from the prophet Isaiah, those ones that I just read, prepare the way of the Lord in the desert, make a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made Lo, the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places a plain. I want us to think for a few minutes about that one line, the crooked shall be made straight. When John preaches these words from the prophet, the Greek word there, the crooked shall be made straight, the Greek word for crooked is skolios. And any of you that have lived with scoliosis of any variety, uh, you know the affliction of it. Hopefully you've been able to manage it. It is, in fact, the curvature of one's spine. 
In my last congregation, I knew a woman named, uh, there was a woman in the parish named Edith. She was born and she went through puberty in a time before they had ever developed this stiff plastic jacket that you wear in 360 fashion that buckles up tightly from your underarms to your hips. And I grew up with a kid who wore one of these stiff plastic jackets 23 hours a day. I think the definition of which is uncomfortable. Scoliosis. She walked sideways. Her curvature was actually 50 or 49 degrees. So she would see the world sideways because her spine was unable to be straightened out. Scolios. So snakes move. They plant the front segment of their body in the ground. They bunch up the rest of their body. And then they lock down the back end and push forward, obviously with great speed. But snakes have the look of that uh, Door County Road. The crooked shall be made straight. It would be wonderful, would it not, if the totality of our lives, if the fullness of all of our experiences, if the successes of our health, the sturdiness of our body, it would be wonderful if they would always follow some straight path, some narrow path, that everything would work in our favor. That nothing about our moral selves would ever be crooked. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It would be. But you know as well as I do that not everything about our lives is as straight as Highway 46 there in North Dakota. Not everything works the way we wish it would, the way we think it should, the way God hopes it will. We have our issues. We have our disappointments. We're really capable of some pretty interesting sins. We have our detours. We have our circuitous routes from A to B. All I have to think about is the friends that I have, and many of you as well, who often have to wait and wait for a doctor's appointment. There's a member who's looking to get into a geneticist, and it's over 12 months before she can get her daughter in to see a geneticist. And when you can't control the date or the time slot for that appointment, you know, we get anxious. We, we, we worry. It starts to mess with us. And we begin to wonder, you know, if our condition's complicated, we're just kind of taking two steps forward, one step back. If it's cancer, that's really a circuitous route. Some of you probably define your life as two steps forward, one step back, as if that was invented, that phrase, for you. If only everything followed a straight line in this life, and it didn't wind all over the place, and we didn't have all these detours, or these bumps, or these curves. I sometimes wonder if there's a single family in this congregation, I'll include my own family among them, that does not have at least one individual in the expanded clan, think of your cousins and your in-laws and all the rest, who is not somehow estranged from the family or doesn't really communicate with others or holds a grudge for some reason or you never know when they're going to show up or a person who doesn't initiate contact or, or who doesn't understand the love that you try to be about. That just isn't their modus operandi. If only everything followed a straight line in life and didn't curve all over the place. If only. Supreme Court Justice John Roberts, two years ago, he delivered the commencement address at his son's middle school. So his son was graduated from eighth grade, and why not call on John Roberts to deliver the commencement address? So he wanted these eighth graders to realize that the path to their happiness, the path to their health and wholeness, the path to any kind of success in life was not going to be a straight line. It's full of issues, it's full of disappointments, it's full of detours, and it often has this circuitous route. This is what he said to those eighth graders. From time to time in the years to come, I hope you'll be treated unfairly so that you will come to know the value of justice. I hope you will be lonely from time to time so that you don't take your friends for granted. I also wish you bad luck 
from time to time. So you will be conscious of the role that chance plays in life. I hope you will understand that your success is not completely deserved, just as the failure of a lot of other people is not completely deserved. I hope you'll be ignored so you learn the importance or know the importance of listening to others. He went on, I hope you have just enough pain in your life that you learn all about compassion. And then he said, whether I wish these things on you or not, they're going to happen. And he went on to describe how we look at the curves and twists and turns of life is really significant. If only everything in life followed a straight line and it just didn't twist and turn all over the place, wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if, if, if life just answered to our whims and our, our desires and our privileges and our good tastes and all the rest? Well, these ancient Israelites, as I indicated before, they had been in exile a rough kind of 50 years away from home up in Babylon. It was morally degrading. It was mentally humiliating. Uh, they were beleaguered people. They didn't have a secure home. They didn't have the place that, they, that the generations before them had built up and had known. They were stripped of so much hope. The reason they ended up in Babylon is because they followed their sins and their distorted lives and belonged there. But this is where the prophet Isaiah speaks these, these magnificent words. You served your term, he tells them as they're coming home. You served your term and then some. But what you need to know now is that your penalty has been paid, and from the Lord you will receive double for your sins. That would be double grace. Life was not easy in exile. It wasn't easy at, at all. They suffered tremendously. But the prop, prophet uh, presents them with this astonishing idea that the living God will march them through the wilderness over the hill country that exists between Babylon and Jerusalem and will bring them home. And the prophet says, there are going to be some obstacles that need to be pushed out of the way. You're going to have to dig some ditches so that the rainwater doesn't erode the road. You're going to have to get some excavation going, and, and, and level these bumpy spots. And the crooked roads, those ones that look like a boa constrictor, a twisted spine, they must be transformed into Highway 46. Now, best I can tell, um, Isaiah wasn't really talking about road construction. I think he was talking about the the composition and moral texture of these lives, of these Hebrew people, that by God's grace, they would have half a chance to become whole again. The prophet goes a little further, and he reminds these Israelites, and I think us as well, that uh, everything but God will eventually let you down. Your friends will, at some point in time, let you down. You will let yourself down. Your idols, and my idols in life, they are certainly going to let us down. Everything but God will eventually let us down. And to underscore the frailty of our existence and the fragility of our lives and the fleeting nature of our existence, the prophet says, all people are grass. Yeah, you can go home, look in the mirror and say, I'm a piece of grass. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Yes, the people are grass, but the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. I think Advent is this great season to divest the hope that we have in ourselves and try to transfer that hope to something we have in God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. You know, I often hear people say after a death, I'll never forget Bill for the rest of my life. Every day, I'm going to remember Bill, and the world's going to remember Bill. He, he, he's unforgettable, and I'm telling you, every day. So we write a beautiful obituary, and we grieve appropriately as we need to do. Um, and we speak of the world never forgetting. 
But you know what? We do forget. Because life is fleeting, it's fragile, it's frail, it's short, it's transient. Not a single one of you today has thought yet about your great-grandmother or your great-great-grandfather. I'm sure of it. But they were beautiful people. They lived like you and I are breathing right now. But the grass withers, the flower fades. There's one thing that endures. It is the word of the Lord forever. So I want to remember this, I think, and send you away with it as well. That when we talk about being saved or being whole or having a life that's together or, or, or following this hopefully straight road as opposed to the crooked detours of life, we are not saved by our character. Pleasant as you may be or moral as I may be, we're not saved by our character. We are not saved by progress. We are not saved by technology. We are not saved by either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. We are saved, we are made whole, we are given the lives we have by the Lord, whose very character is love, and who is determined to be interested in you and interested in me to straighten out some of the crookedness of our lives. How? By speaking tenderly to us despite our sins. By handing us a cup that's overflowing with grace. You've paid your penalty, so the prophet says. The Lord will... We'll, we'll give you double for those sins. It's that grace we need to behold when life's not working in our favor and when we find ourselves on a twisty, turning, and crooked road. So let me close today with a prayer. It's one of the great collects of the church, prayers of the church, written by whom I don't know a long time ago, but I commend it to all of us. Let us pray. O oh God, who has prepared for all who love you such good things as exceed our human understanding, pour into our hearts such love for you that loving you above everything else, we may obtain your promise, which exceeds all that we can ask, imagine, or desire through Christ our Lord. Amen.
I'd invite you to join me in prayer, as we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, just as the Lord spoke tenderly to the ancient Hebrew people, and just as the Lord speaks tenderly to us in our sins, may the Lord bless you this week with tender speech for all whom you meet. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast, and thanks for your support of the ministries of St. Paul Lutheran Church. Our commitment to projects that lend hope to other people stretches across the country and around the world. We hope that in a good way you feel a part of that reach. Tune in next Thursday for another edition of the St. Paul Podcast.